tiroteos se comenzaron a las 12 de la noche. The shooting began at midnight, and everyone ran toward their homes. People started hollering. Children began crying. It was a complex operation. 27 targets were hit simultaneously. I heard my family, some of my family get shot, and I don't know nothing else has happened. I just was keep going because I was frightened to die. I was frightened to die. The goal was not to level the place, but to minimize damage to property, and most important of all, to minimize casualties, uh, and that was accomplished. My daughter did not belong to any group. She had nothing to do with Noriega. She was innocent. She had nothing to do with all of this, and they killed her. If I had to do it again, I would do it again because the cost was high. It was men, women, civilians, and military that gave their lives, not for us. They gave their lives for democracy, for liberty, for freedom. And I don't mind paying any price under the sun to be free. Boys, bomba! Sabrosa! Mamita, mami. Mami, esto sí es verdad. Que yo quiero bailar contigo esta Navidad. Yo me voy con Luis Ramírez a comer lechón. Y después sigue el vacilón en casa de Don Ramón. Ay, mamita, mami. Mami, esto sí es verdad. Lo sabes tú, mami. Que quiero bailar contigo esta Navidad. Y mamita, mami. Sonando el tambor y yo vengo a cantar sabrosa mi bomba. On December 19, 1989, while Panamanians were getting ready for the Christmas holidays, the United States was secretly mobilizing 26,000 troops for a midnight attack. Helicopters approaching. They were close. The lights went out and the helicopters began to shoot. People were running left and right without direction, without knowing where they were going. It wasn't just machine gun fire, they were bombs. The noise was frightening. You could hear gunfire coming from all directions and a strange noise that we had never heard before. People were frightened, running, wondering what was going on. The sky was completely red and there was a tremor you could feel throughout the city. The invasion was swift, intense and merciless. When it was over, 
Thousands lay dead and wounded, and the country was in shambles. Millions of U.S. tax dollars were swallowed up in three days of brutal violence. The strategy was considered a stunning military and political success. The operation continues, uh... In many ways, the invasion served as a testing ground for the Persian Gulf War one year later. It is also an indication of the kinds of intervention the United States may undertake in the years to come. But still, big questions remain. What exactly happened during the invasion of Panama, and why? This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rattle reporting. Good evening. More than 20,000 U.S. soldiers and Marines launched their attack in the early morning darkness, backed by swarms of helicopters. As the invasion unfolded, Americans stayed glued to their TVs and newspapers for coverage. But how much of the real picture did the media give them? The performance of the mainstream news media in the coverage of Panama has been just about total collaboration with the administration. Not a critical murmur, not a critical perspective, not a second thought. The story that the White House was pushing was getting this so-called narco-terrorist in a net. And that was the, the thrust of all of the coverage. Uh, when are we going to get Noriega? Have they let Noriega get away? By late today, they had taken control of much of the country, but their chief target, General Manuel Noriega, escaped. Manuel Noriega belongs to that special fraternity of international villains, men like Gaddafi, Idi Amin, and the Ayatollah Khomeini, whom Americans just love to hate. Tonight, the White House announced a $1 million reward for his capture. And today, capture. the Justice Department set up a hotline to take in tips on Noriega's possible whereabouts. That hotline number... They focused on Noriega to the exclusion of what was happening to the Panamanian people, to the exclusion of the bodies in the street, to the exclusion of the number dead, to the exclusion of what happened to the women and children in that country during this midnight invasion. In some ways, the 1989 U.S. invasion of Panama was no surprise given the history of relations between these two countries. The United States refused to recognize Panama's independence movement throughout the 1800s. But when the U.S. proposal to build a canal across the isthmus was turned down by Colombia, U.S. policy abruptly changed. In 1903, the United States provided military backup, enabling Panama to secede from Colombia. By doing so, the United States secured the rights to take over the canal project that had been abandoned by the French. In a treaty that was negotiated between the French canal investors and the United States, the Americans were granted sovereign control in perpetuity of a 10-mile wide strip of land they called the Canal Zone. Panamanians were not included in the negotiations and no Panamanian signed the treaty. The United States immediately placed the canal zone under military control. Teddy Roosevelt was asked by what right he acquired possession of the canal. At least in the honest words <laughs> of a thief, he said, I took it. Uh, that gives you no right in law, never has. And hopefully, never will. The canal project had a dramatic impact on Panama. The U.S. imported cheap labor from the Caribbean, India, and Asia, changing the racial makeup of the country. Thousands of these workers died, and those who remained lived as part of a new racial underclass. They created an apartheid system in Panama, a system that was based on racial segregation where black people could not live in the same homes, where black people could not even use the same water fountain. The Jim Crow law that was practiced in the southern part of the United States was implemented in Panama by the United States government.
after the canal was completed in 1913, the United States continued to expand its military presence and tighten its grip on Panamanian politics. Violent confrontations between Panamanians and the U.S. military grew in the decades that followed. Tensions peaked in 1964 when students tried to exercise Panama's right to fly its flag in the canal zone. 21 Panamanians were killed and hundreds were wounded in the confrontation. In 1968, Panama's government was overthrown in a military coup. Omar Torrijos, a colonel in the National Guard, emerged as the new leader of Panama. Although he used repressive measures to consolidate his power, he became immensely popular. Torrijos introduced an unexpected period of social reform that benefited Panama's majority population of blacks, Indians, and mestizos. It created what some people call a populist reformist process. Umberto Brown, an administrator at the State University of New York, served as a Panamanian diplomat to the United Nations. He was educated in Panama during the Torrijos period. We're for first time in Panama you had a participation of the non-oligarchical people of the nation. Where people like myself get opportunity to, to go to university, get a degree where the peasants, where people from the mestizo, the, where, where all the people who were deprived of an opportunity for once in our life were playing important roles in our nation. In 1978, relations between the United States and Panama reached a high point. Jimmy Carter and Omar Torrijos negotiated treaties that abolished the 1903 treaty, establishing a new relationship between the two countries. The Carter-Torrijos treaties required the United States to vacate its military bases and withdraw its troops by the year 2000. Full control of the canal and the canal zone would be turned over to Panama. Although these new treaties were a source of pride for Panamanians, many conservatives in the United States had vehemently opposed them. The Panama Canal Zone is sovereign United States territory, just as much as Alaska is, as well as the states carved from the Louisiana Purchase. We bought it, we paid for it, and General Torrio should be told we're going to keep it. In November 1980, Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter in a landslide election victory. Eight months later, on the night of July 31st, 1981, Omar Torrijos was killed in a fiery plane crash. The circumstances of the incident are unclear. Authorities said that his plane crashed into the side of a mountain. But witnesses said that the plane exploded in flight. Although his death was officially declared an accident, many suspect that he was assassinated. Some think that Manuel Noriega may have been involved. But many are convinced it was the CIA that was responsible. I'm quite convinced that the CIA killed Torrijos. And this I know quite well because I, I work with Torrijos. And Jose Chuchu Martinez was one of Torrijos' closest aides for many years. They killed him precisely at the moment they had to kill him, at the moment that Torrijos was having a big influence over, all, over Central America. Uh, especially among the revolutionary movements. They killed Torrijos because Torrijos represented precisely the a political solution of the, of the whole Central American problem. Waiting in the wings for his chance to take power was Colonel Manuel Noriega, the CIA's primary contact in Panama. Noriega was head of Panama's military intelligence and had a long-standing relationship with the United States. He had been on the CIA payroll since the 60s. When George Bush became director of the CIA in 1976, under President Ford, he inherited Noriega as a contact. Despite evidence that Noriega was involved in drug trafficking, Bush kept Noriega on the payroll. In fact, 
he increased Noriega's salary to more than $100,000 a year and eliminated a requirement that intelligence reports on Panama include information on drug trafficking. Over the last 20 years, since Manuel Noriega was recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency to be an asset, he has obviously provided many, many important pieces of information to U.S. intelligence. Peter Kornblue is senior analyst at the National Security Archive. The archive has assembled hundreds of previously classified government documents revealing the details of Noriega's relationship to U.S. intelligence. They paid him an incredible amount of money, of American taxpayers' money, and obviously decided that his value to them uh, was uh, so important that his drug smuggling and other illegal activity could simply be ignored. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that I will support and defend... After George Bush became vice president under Ronald Reagan in 1981, he was named head of the administration's anti-drug campaign and once again took responsibility for monitoring Noriega's intelligence activities. Bush, in fact, seems to have been instrumental even according to the documented evidence the administration itself has made available in seeing to it that Noriega was well taken care of. And in fact, Admiral Stansfield Turner, the former director of the CIA under Carter, claims that he cut Noriega off, that he removed him from the U.S. payroll. Bush put him back on and in fact gave him a raise and developed an even closer relationship than it existed before. With support from the CIA, Noriega was able to outmaneuver his rivals, and in August of 1983, he became commander of the Panamanian military. As the Reagan administration expanded its covert war against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, Noriega became increasingly helpful. Working with the CIA and with Israeli arms dealers, Noriega helped coordinate an arms supply network to provide weapons to contrabases in northern Costa Rica. It is by now undeniable that the same planes that were carrying arms from Panama into Costa Rica were also carrying drugs. And in fact, the people who were the pilots flying those arms to the Contras and flying drugs on up, eventually reaching the United States, have been indicted and are now serving time. This operation essentially gave Manuel Noriega the assurance that they would turn a blind eye to his continued brokering of cocaine deals. In return, for using his network to get the arms to the Contras in northern Costa Rica. Noriega's involvement in the drug traffic really increased his importance as a source for the CIA and as someone who was able to conduct dirty tricks in the region for the CIA. So it's no accident that the CIA became the most prominent defenders of Noriega against the drug charges because that's the sort of thing which CIA clients tend to do. Time after time, when we install strongmen in the third world, because we want them to be strong, we want to see them involved with the strongest local economic forces, which time after time are the drug traffic. Despite Noriega's collaboration with many U.S. covert operations, he was becoming increasingly uncooperative with U.S. objectives in Central America. In 1984, he angered the Reagan administration by hosting Latin American leaders at the Contadora Peace Talks. The talks called for an end to U.S. intervention in Central American affairs. Noriega was not the yes man that the United States wanted him to be. 
He simply didn't like to be pushed around. He certainly didn't like people like John Poindexter uh, or even William Casey coming down to his uh, villa and telling him what he should do or what he shouldn't do. Then in 1986, the Iran-Contra scandal erupted. Noriega's primary contacts in the administration were now under intense scrutiny. Oliver North was fired, Poindexter was forced to resign, and William Casey fell ill with a brain tumor. So all three of Noriega's major protectors were out of government, uh, and that led quickly to, um, to a shift in U.S. policy. Sentiments within Panama were turning against Noriega as well. For three years, Noriega worked with the DEA in a sting operation codenamed Operation Pisces. In 1987, with Noriega's assistance, authorities arrested hundreds of suspects and froze millions of dollars in Panama's banks, severely disrupting the money laundering business. The financial community was outraged and Noriega's opponents mobilized against him. Back in Washington, Noriega's opponents lobbied and testified against him, accusing him of murder, corruption, and drug running. The U.S. media quickly turned it into a major story. United States, but relations with Panama are under a new cloud tonight because of news reports Senator alleging... Senator Jesse Helms charged today that the military strongman of Panama, Manuel Noriega, is the number one drug trafficker in the Americas. Helms said depending on how the situation with Noriega... The reports from U.S. intelligence have also led to new investigations on Capitol Hill. Faced with increased pressure, both in the U.S. and Panama, Noriega introduced a wave of brutal repression, attacking protesters in the streets and jailing hundreds of opponents. The Reagan administration now openly called for his removal. We do want Noriega out of there and a return to a civilian democratic government. But behind the scenes, the administration was secretly negotiating with Noriega, promising not to indict him on drug charges if he would cooperate with U.S. objectives in Central America. Gabriel Gemma, director of the Independent Commission of Inquiry on the U.S. invasion of Panama, spoke to Noriega about his negotiations with the U.S. Gerald Noriega told us that there were a number of demands placed on him directly, both through Poindexter and other meetings, where the State Department pressured him to change the Panamanian government's policy on several issues. He said that by far the most pressing was a demand by the United States that Noriega and the Panamanian government allow the U.S. to expand their military presence in Panama and to renegotiate the treaties to allow them to keep control over the 14 bases, military bases, that presently exist in Panama. Noriega refused to agree to the U.S. demands or to relinquish his power in Panama. In February 1988, two U.S. federal grand juries in Florida indicted Noriega, accusing him of drug trafficking, money laundering, and racketeering. It was the first time a foreign head of state had ever been indicted in the United States. The U.S. now undertook a systematic effort to overthrow Noriega. Economic sanctions were stepped up and additional troops were dispatched to Panama. The United States tonight declared in effect that Panama's General Manuel Noriega is a threat to this country's national security. Mr. Noriega, the drug indicted, drug related, indicted dictator of Panama. We want to bring him to justice, we want to get him out, and we want to restore democracy to Panama and so when you read these outrageous charges by a drug related indicted dictator discount them they are total lies still unable to force Noriega from power the United States turned its efforts to influencing the upcoming 1989 Panamanian national elections The Bush administration, working through the CIA and the National Endowment for Democracy, funneled more than $10 million into the opposition's slate of candidates. Presidential candidate Guillermo Endara, a wealthy corporate lawyer educated in the United States, 
and his vice presidential running mates, Guillermo, Billy Ford, and Ricardo Arias Calderon. If the same scenario that those elections um, occurred in had taken place in the United States, they would have been illegal. In the United States, accepting money from a foreign government for the purpose of influencing a domestic election is illegal. Those elections were irregular from the beginning. How can you call it a fair election? The strategy is was applied in Panama, they applied in Nicaragua, and they were applied to every government who disagree with the U.S. foreign policy. They use economical sanction to starve people then to impose a vote on these people because people vote to get bread when they're hungry. And I don't think that's democracy. The elections were held, the counting of the votes began, it became clear that uh, the PRD would lose the election. And at that point, uh, the, and not for the first time in the history of Panama or many other countries in Central America, the uh, military rulers halted the electoral process. The country erupted in violence as ballot boxes were seized. The U.S. supported candidates who had been leading in vote tallies were brutally beaten on the streets of Panama City in front of rolling TV cameras. were alleged to be Noriega's dignity battalions, although none were ever identified. It was a photo opportunity that crystallized world public opinion against Noriega. Good evening. The violence in Panama escalated sharply this evening when government goons attacked candidates opposed to General Manuel Noriega. Were attacked and beaten up on the streets of Panama City. Guillermo Indara, and one of the opposition presidential candidates, was beaten and injured during the day by backers of military strong. Later, the presidential candidate, Indara, was released from the hospital. It has been confirmed that he was attacked by goons. The following day, President Bush ordered 2,000 additional troops into Panama. I will do what is necessary to protect the lives of American citizens. And we will not be intimidated by the bullying tactics, brutal though they may be, of the dictator Noriega. After the election fiasco, the Panamanian National Assembly declared a state of emergency and appointed Noriega head of state. George Bush now openly encouraged the Panamanian military to revolt against Noriega. We'd love to see him get him out. We'd like to see him out of there. With support and encouragement from the United States, a group of officers from the Panamanian Defense Forces, the PDF, began planning a military coup to overthrow Noriega. They secretly met several times with the U.S. Southern Command to coordinate support for the overthrow. The role to be played by the United States Army was to block certain roads, make sure that certain airfields were not made available for use by elements loyal to or potentially loyal to General Noriega. With these assurances, the insurgent troops launched the coup attempt. They quickly overpowered Noriega's guards, seized the PDF headquarters, and captured Noriega. But the Americans did not carry through on their promises. Forces loyal to Noriega were allowed to gain entrance and crush the rebellion, freeing General Noriega. President Bush later denied any U.S. involvement in the operation. This was some American operation, and I can tell you that is not true. But I would repeat, in the hopes that it be conveyed instantly to Panama, we have no argument with the Panamanian Defense Forces. We have no argument with them. We've had good relations with the Panamanian Defense Forces. But investigative journalist Doug Vaughn, who was in Panama during the failed coup attempt, disputes Bush's claims. That the idea, at least on the American side, was to lead these coup plotters along, to seduce them into believing that they had the support of the United States, 
and then at a critical moment abandon them so that then the excuse could be made that we had to smash the PDF completely, that we couldn't rely anymore on disgruntled officers inside the Panamanian Army to rise up against Noriega, and we would have to do this job ourselves. After the October coup attempt, 1,300 additional U.S. troops were flown into Panama, and offensive military equipment was secretly deployed. The U.S. military stepped up its campaign of intimidation and provocation, setting up roadblocks, confronting PDF forces, and conducting offensive military maneuvers outside of U.S. jurisdiction. They have blocked passage here, calling it a security problem. What security? The Panamanian people would never threaten them. They are the ones threatening. They are the ones who charged at us with their weapons. What's wrong with them? They charged the bayonets at us. They charged us with their bayonets in order to scare us. They said not to step onto that area, but they're on our side. It's Panama's jurisdiction. So what the hell's with them? It came to an inch that that day the killing didn't start because the tanks and everything were ready to go in to kill the Panamanian people. In the final months before the invasion, the Army Special Operations Command sent a highly secret Delta Force team to Panama. There were numerous actions undertaken by that Delta team which were reported in the United States press as uh, provocations undertaken by Panamanians against the United States, infiltrations of United States positions, shots fired in the direction of, of uh, United States uh, perimeters and positions, uh, roughing up of United States citizens in the streets. Sabina Virgo, a national labor organizer, was in Panama just weeks before the invasion. Provocations against the Panamanian people by United States military troops were very frequent in Panama. And they had several results, and in my opinion, probably a couple of different intents. One, I think, was to create an international incident, was to have United States troops just hassle the Panamanian people until an incident resulted and from that incident, the United States could then say that they were going into Panama for the protection of American life, which is in fact exactly what happened. On the night of December 16th, a group of U.S. Marines ran a military roadblock in front of PDF headquarters and were fired on by Panamanian guards. <laughs> Lieutenant Robert Bolivar Paz, a U.S. Marine intelligence officer, was killed. The Marines were reported to be part of a group called the Hard Chargers, known for provoking confrontations with PDF forces. The Pentagon claimed the Marines were unarmed and lost, but local witnesses said that they were armed and exchanged fire with the PDF headquarters, wounding a soldier and two civilians. An American serviceman has been killed in a weekend shooting incident. Another what American U.S. officials military. called an example of General Noriega's cruelty and brutality. Shooting death of an American officer, which President Bush condemned today as an outrage. And that in another incident, a Navy officer and his wife were detained. He beaten and threatened with death. She threatened sexually. Another American serviceman also threatening that man's wife. Strong public support for a reprisal was all but guaranteed. Four days later, on December 20th, U.S. troops invaded Panama. The invasion was codenamed Operation Just Cause. Shortly after midnight, U.S. troops simultaneously attacked 27 targets, many of which were in densely populated areas. One of the primary targets in Panama City was the headquarters of the Panamanian Defense Forces, 
located in the crowded neighborhood of El Chorillo. U.S. troops shelled the area for four hours before moving in and calling for surrender. About 10 minutes after they've been speaking this surrender, surrender, we start to hear the helicopters start to bomb the quartel and start to use their, their laser ray and things like that. So we hit, we hit the ground. It soon became clear that the objectives were not limited only to military targets. According to witnesses, many of the surrounding residential neighborhoods were deliberately attacked and destroyed. The helicopters were heavily armed, firing powerful machine guns and rockets, and they were firing indiscriminately. They weren't just looking for military targets. They were firing at many civilians. People were running all over, trying to escape. They shot at everything that moved, without mercy and without thinking whether they were children or women or people fighting. Instead, everything that moved, they shot. We all thought that they would just take Noriega. They said that's what they wanted. They would take him and would respect everyone else. After the bombing, the bombing been started, been going on for a few few hours. The soldiers say, tell everybody to come out with their hand on their head, and they direct us to the church. When we were in the church about six o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, the building start to burn in front of the church. The people, them, as they know, they have. The only thing they had was inside that place. They tried to run out to get water to halt it. And the American soldiers tell them to get out. Some people, you know, stubborn, they try to go in, and the American soldiers, he shot it up in the air. <laughs> and the people that get scared, and they run back. We saw that the North Americans were denying people access to their homes. They sent people back and threatened them with their machine guns and forbid anyone to get close to the houses or walk in or around the alleys leading to the houses. Then they began to set the houses on fire. The Panamanian soldiers then know each alley, how to go in and how to come out and where to go and come through, you know, from one street to another street, climb up and go to a balcony and things. So the only way I think the American soldiers could get rid of that, that danger was to burn down the building there. That way the, the, the Panamanian soldier couldn't have nowhere to hide. I'm unaware of any operations by U.S. military to go through and systematically burn down buildings. Uh, you get fires that, that are started by weapons, but I, I haven't seen any reports of U.S. military folks going through and setting buildings on fire. The North Americans began burning down El Chorrillo at about 6.30 in the morning. They would throw a small device into a house and it would catch on fire. They would burn a house and then move to another and begin the process all over again. They burned from one street to the next. They coordinated the burning through walkie-talkies. And from there, the whole of Chorillo went to nothing.
Pentagon used Panama as a testing ground for newly developed high-tech weapons, such as the stealth fighter, the Apache attack helicopter, and laser-guided missiles. There are also reports that can't be explained indicating the use of experimental and unknown weaponry. Nosotros tenemos testimonio de personas combatientes que murieron. We have testimony about combatants who died literally melted with their guns as a result of a laser. We know of automobiles that were cut in half by these lasers of atrocities committed by weapons that fire poison darts which produce massive bleeding. I think there's a high probability that there was uh, a use of sophisticated weaponry merely to test it. Ramsey Clark, former U.S. Attorney General, has conducted extensive research into the invasion. Uh, above all, though, there was... Um, a use beyond any conceivable necessity of just sheer firepower. Just an excessive use of force uh, beyond any possible justification. President Bush wanted to make certain that this was going to be a success. This was going to be his vindication, a, a denial of the wimp factor in spades. So they sent down a force that wasn't going to encounter any effective resistance, would simply overwhelm the opposition and the fact that it would cause tremendous peripheral damage, damage to innocent civilians in, on a wide scale, was not of concern in the planning. What we intended to do was re to reduce collateral damage. I don't know what that means. Collateral. collateral damage, that means if the target is right here, you're trying not to have damage to other places. You're trying to have damage to a specific target because that's a military target, and you're trying to minimize damage outside of the military target. And they worked. My God, we were sending in artillery and airstrikes against a very heavily populated urban area. There was absolutely no question that there were going to be immense numbers of civilian casualties. We walked among the dead and saw the tanks run over and crush our dead. We saw a great number of civilian cars with whole families inside. Kids, women and the driver torn to pieces and crushed by the tanks. The soldiers passed the tanks over the people's bodies. Some of them dead, some of them wounded. And there were cases that we know, for example, the case of Manuel Carro, the case of Alexander Huber and some others whose bodies were totally destroyed. During the days and weeks following the invasion, the U.S. policy of applying overwhelming deadly force continued. There were many reports of indiscriminate killings and executions of unarmed civilians. We have eyewitness accounts on the part of a number of Panamanians where soldiers took Panamanians who had been captured uh, after the invasion and executed them on the street. I have seen no reports of U.S. soldiers executing anyone in Panama. We have carefully checked out every such report and if we think there is evidence that a U.S. soldier murdered a Panamanian, we will court-martial that soldier. Uh, that, uh, that sort of behavior would be absolutely unprofessional, totally unacceptable, and illegal. Rafael Olivardia, a community leader from El Chirillo, was taken to the Balboa High School detention camp the morning after the attack. There were many Panamanian troops at the Balboa concentration camp. They didn't seem to know what was going on. They were sitting on the grass with their arms and feet tied with plastic bands. I, along with many other people from El Chorrillo, witnessed their execution right in front of us. 
eight of the soldiers at the entrance were executed by U.S. troops. There were many reports of unprovoked killings at U.S. roadblocks. One woman told human rights investigators how her brother and four friends were killed at a roadblock on December 23rd, three days after the initial attack. All five of the passengers were forced out of the car and put face down on the ground. They were riddled with bullets. They were simply going to visit family members when they were detained and killed in the street. Although 19 cases of homicide and alleged executions were filed with the Southern Command, all but two of these cases were internally reviewed and dismissed. During the invasion and throughout the days and weeks that followed, access by the news media was tightly controlled. The Pentagon flew in a 16-person press pool from the major U.S. media. The pool did not reach Panama, however, until after the crucial first four hours of the attack and were restricted to U.S. military bases for the next day and a half. Our regret is that we were not able to use the media pool more effectively. The goal was to get reporters down there so that they could see for themselves the early hours of the operation. Now, once they got there, uh, we had a breakdown in our ability to move them around. Uh, helicopters that we thought were going to be available had to be pulled off and were needed for, for the operation itself. The press pool that went down there was managed from the day they arrived. They were only taken to see what the government, what the military wanted them to see, and there has been continuous uh, suppression and denial of the extent of damage which was inflicted during that invasion. Many journalists who tried to investigate on their own were stopped by U.S. troops from entering areas that were attacked. Can I see your credentials, please? One of the few journalists who was able to penetrate the military's restrictions was Panamanian photographer Julio Guerra. I had already taken photographs in the Chorillo area. I'd also taken photos of some dead bodies in the street. When a North American soldier told me I couldn't walk any further, they wanted to take my camera away, but I didn't let them. So they made me open the camera and expose the roll of film with the shots of the dead bodies I had taken. Military folks shouldn't be taking film out of cameras. Uh, you get young guys in combat, they get concerned. They do that sometimes. I don't think that was the norm. Another Panamanian journalist, Manuel Becker, a cameraman for a London-based news service, was covering the attack on the night of the invasion when he was stopped by U.S. troops. We almost got to the edge of El Chorillo. As soon as we were able to, we started videotaping. But the North American troops took our tapes and placed us virtually under arrest until the bombing was over. A Spanish news photographer who, uh, in the early moments, was able to get a picture of bodies lined up in the morgue was subsequently shot under very uh, strange circumstances. There was not a conflict, but uh, according to the reports of colleagues, an American soldier just up, took aim, and shot him down. The U.S. military also targeted the Panamanian media. Radio stations were immediately taken over and destroyed. U.S. forces occupied TV stations and began transmitting their own signal. Many journalists were either arrested or fired. One of Panama's largest daily newspapers, La Repubblica, was raided, ransacked, and closed down by American troops. The U.S. military's control over all of the media was so effective that there is almost no video footage of the first three days of the invasion other than what was shot by the military's own camera crews. It's so ironic that uh, the kind of very tight press control 
that you used to see in Russia under Stalin and under Brezhnev, and which was finally ending under Gorbachev with Glasnost, that we've seen in the United States exactly the opposite phenomenon, a new degree of press control, which we never had in Vietnam, so that the American people didn't really know what had happened until it was all over and it was too late. During the week of the invasion, more than 18,000 people who fled from the areas of attack were forced into temporary detention centers created by the U.S. forces. It was a war, it was a battle, and the way you get it over with is to find the people who are most likely to keep shooting at you and try to detain them, and that was the goal of that operation. We arrived at the concentration camp of Balboa, a school. It was surrounded by a barbed wire fence and full of heavily armed soldiers. When we arrived, they picked all the men between the ages of 15 and 55 and put us on an army truck. The women were crying, shouting. They were pushing us around and we didn't know where they were taking us. They took us to a secret place and we were submitted to an intense interrogation. Then they put a card in front of us and took our picture. So all men between 15 and 55 had this card with their ID number and their refugee number. As part of the invasion, the U.S. forces worked with newly installed Panamanian officials to institute repressive measures that continue in Panama today. American forces took control of the public buildings, government ministries, and the university. Almost every organization opposed to United States policy had its offices raided and destroyed. Thousands of individuals were arrested. Arias Calderon, Endara, and the Attorney General Rogelio Cruz effectively wrote down the names of their political enemies, gave them to U.S. military personnel, who, going around like stormtroopers, would break down doors, drag people out of their houses, take them to detention centers, only because their name was given by one of these officials and that there was no legal case against these people whatsoever. I got it, I got it, I got you covered. Watch that door up there, man. Yeah. Get the door. Get the door. Come on, keep the eye on that fucking window. Oh, get his ass up. I got it, Clay, and I bust his ass over. Government officials had to go underground many of them, in order not to be arrested, including university professors. There were uh, former government and diplomatic officials that were arrested and interned at refugee camps and some of them in prisons. The list runs into the thousands. Why are they after him? Why aren't they after Bush instead? He's the one who's killing people all over the place. Why are they harassing a worker who's defending other workers? Twenty-six times, 
26 times the U.S. troops were here searching my house. They would surround everything with tanks and would take books, personal documents, photos of Torrillos. They would search it whenever they felt like it. Balbina Herrera de Perignon was the mayor of San Miguelito and a member of the National Assembly. After the invasion, she was subjected to a relentless campaign of slander and harassment. The Southern Command put up wanted posters with my photo. If you see her, please call such and such a number at Southern Command. They interrogated my children, my three little ones. They would ask them where their mother was, where their father was. They would ask them for information about us. Escolastico Calvo, the editor of La Repubblica newspaper, had been openly critical of the new government and the U.S. invasion. What I don't understand is that they've been holding me here 30 days and no one has talked to me about my case, about my charge. This is what we want a decision on. Is there justice here or not? Calvo was imprisoned for 18 months. No charges were ever filed against him. They arrested close to 7,000 Panamanian individuals. They arrested almost every trade union leader, the leaders of the nationalist parties, of progressive parties, of left parties in Panama. They arrested people who were cultural leaders. There are still hundreds of Panamanians who remain in jail with no due process, with no formal charges against them. As a result of the U.S. invasion, an estimated 20,000 Panamanians lost their homes. Hardest hit were residents in the poor neighborhoods of San Miguelito, Colon, Panama Viejo, and El Chorillo. Survivors of the invasion received little assistance from either the newly installed Panamanian government or the United States. Many moved into bombed out buildings and makeshift shelters. Several thousand were moved to Albrook Airfield and housed in two large airplane hangars where many languished for more than a year. In hangar number one, we constructed 506 cubicles. It's a 10 by 10 uh, foot cubicle which holds each of the families and um, in each cubicle we can put as much as four cats and a small mattresses for the kids. Although the Albrook refugee camp was administered by the Panamanian Red Cross and the United States Agency for International Development, U.S. military police would frequently enter the grounds, restrict access and make arrests. With explicit permission from the directors of the camp, our camera crew entered to interview refugees about their experience of the invasion and its aftermath. Let me see if there's anything else. Hello. But even though we had authorization, U.S. military police and the Criminal Investigation Division of the U.S. Army tried to stop our crew from videotaping. The marshal's office just called me and they said that they detained everybody from filming until they get clearance. I don't know why, that's just what I've been told. I don't think that's right. I think the world is of the, of the right to know the truth. Sir, please, we are the victims. We are the victims. We lose everything. We lose our families. So know why the world not supposed to know the truth, sir. 
Listen, ma'am, until a public affairs official gets here, I cannot allow you to film. refugees surrounded the camera crew, forcing the military to withdraw. Finally, the refugees were able to tell their stories. We're tired of being stuck inside this hangar, sleeping on a cot. Many old people are sick. There's no medical attention. And the children, when? When are they going to put an end to this? We are the victims of Endara's presidency. Why did it have to be us? Why didn't they choose the rich neighborhood? If they had picked 50th Street, it would have been repaired by now. Since it was El Chorrillo, they have forgotten about us. The people are in bad shape. They have no clothes, nothing to wear. I buy them clothes sometimes, and sometimes food out of my own pocket. But one can't do that every day. We need to avoid a problem with the Chorilleros. In the state they're in, they're liable to start a riot. There could be more shootings and more thefts because the people of El Chorillo are very riled up. If they want us to close up all the streets in the country, we're going to do it. But we want answer. We want to get out of this goddamn place. We are tired of this. This is not no democracy. They said they get rid of Noriega, and they're worse of Noriega. They're plenty worse, because with Noriega, we used to eat our three meals a day. Now we're not even eating one. More than 60 Panamanians are reported to have died in that big More than 50 uh, Panamanians were killed. A doctor at a government hospital in Panama City. Casualties, but we've only had really one report on them throughout the day, so we don't know how extensive... Uh, we're getting, I mean, uh, there's, there's no reason to doubt the reports, obviously, that we are getting from the Pentagon, and yet all the information that we are getting from the Pentagon seems to conflict with all the eyewitness information that we're able to get out of Panama City. And we have another Panama. How many people were killed in Panama, and who were they? These questions may never be answered, because the United States military undertook elaborate efforts to conceal the number of dead, how they died, and the location of their bodies. Children died, pregnant women died, seniors died, adolescents died, soldiers died. Victims who had nothing to do with politics, the invasion, or the Noriega regime. What happened in Panama is a hidden horror. Many of the bodies were bulldozed into piles and immolated in the slums where they were collected. Other bodies were left in the garbage chutes of the poor projects in which they died from the shooting, from the artillery, from the machine guns, from the airborne attacks. Others were said to have been pushed into the ocean. When we went down to El Chorrillo, there were still dead bodies inside cars. There was a man and a woman with a child, all of them burnt up inside a car. People from El Chorrillo never thought they would see so many dead bodies, see them being burned on the beach, right, right on the beach they're being burned. In the early hours of the invasion, U.S. troops took control of the hospitals and morgues. Many of the doctors and hospital personnel were detained and thousands of official documents were confiscated. The truth of the matter is that we don't even know how many Panamanians we have killed, but we should have more information on what happened. 
How many civilians were killed? The National Human Rights Commission of Panama interviewed hundreds of people in an effort to determine how many had died. What we have is different testimonies that help us to arrive to the conclusion that for sure there were more than 4,000 people who died. You have the UN Human Rights Commission estimating 2,500 deaths. You have the two major independent human rights organizations in the region estimating 2,500, 3,000, 3,500. You have uh, Isabel Cordero and her organization estimating probably about 4,000. That's an enormous human toll. The U.S. military said 250 civilians were killed. I mean, there isn't a credible source in Panama that believes that's true. Whether it's ambulance drivers, human rights monitors, people, doctors who worked in hospitals, neighbors of bombed out uh, blocks, it's just clearly false. That story would be so easy to tell for any journalist worth his or her salt, but they're not telling it. I made a point of reading the European press as well as the American press when the uh, invasion occurred, and immediately I could see that whereas the American press was talking about maybe a couple of hundred civilian casualties, from the very beginning, the European press was talking about a thousand civilians dead or two thousand civilians dead. So the, the real facts are that the American people didn't really know what had happened in Panama. You would think from the video clips that we had seen that this whole thing was just a Mardi Gras, that the people in Panama were just jumping up and down with glee and that our forces have just moved in there and without taking any lives at all have brought liberty and freedom to these uh, oppressed people. We're tired of this situation in Panama. Does it feel like intervention? No, it's not intervention. They're, they came to save us. I thank them. I, I love them. I love them. They're, they're North American right now. So you think this will end soon? When they interviewed people in Panama about what they thought of it, they invariably were interviewing white, middle-class people who could speak English. They didn't really go into the poor neighborhoods where people had been bombed. Did you see one media actually go into the bombed areas and talk to people who had lost a family or lost everything they had in the bombings? The transport plane. They focused totally on the invasion as a tactical event. Was it effective? Did it work well? Uh, are we losing many American lives? While another unit moved in by helicopter. Fifteen to bomb American servicemen have died in the combat today. Some of it quite but not all the news is good. American casualties are now put at 15 dead and the more than one also announced that one American civilian has been killed. That would make a total of 16. Panama fighting is a school teacher apparently hit by stray gunfire. Gertrude Candy Halen from Dixon, Illinois is the 20th American to die in the fight. They focused with utter ethnocentrism only on American lives. The only life that was precious, the only life that one could report on, the only life that one could consider as a serious loss was an American life. Tonight, as we end this program, we hear from President Bush on the high price these young men paid. And we say goodbye to them. Every human life is precious. And, and yet I have to answer, yes, uh, it has been worth it. In the months following the invasion, Panamanians were shocked to discover the existence of mass graves where hundreds, perhaps thousands, of bodies were hastily dumped into pits and buried by U.S. troops. There was a report of what some were calling a mass grave, which I think is a term that is uh, imprecise. No, I didn't say we had any mass burials. There was one uh, case of... Uh, some number, but I cannot quote to you that number.
To date, there have been 15 mass graves that have been identified throughout Panama. The United States military was directly responsible for the killings of the men, women, and children that are in these mass graves and for their burial. These mass graves exist throughout Panama and some are believed to be on U.S. military bases, which creates a difficulty in terms of access to these mass graves. Among these corpses, we found many young people, 15, 16, 18 years old. We found people in their 60s and in their 70s. We found people killed by a shot to the back of their heads, dead with their hands tied, dead with casts on their legs or arms. Although the Pentagon insists that no more than 516 Panamanians were killed, they do concede that over 75% of those killed were civilians. Families of the victims continue to demand a full accounting of the missing and the dead. Who has the right to determine how many people should be killed in an invasion? I think if one person got killed in an, an invasion that is illegal, that it violates all principles of human rights, the number of people, the quantity, the figures, if it's 10,000 or if it's one, is irrelevant. The issue that innocent people were killed. A lot of people die. Too many people die. Although the U.S. media created a perception of support for the invasion within the United States, the invasion was overwhelmingly condemned in the international community. If you look at any document in international law, any of uh, numerous treaties, it's clear that this invasion was illegal. It's not debatable. The Panama invasion violates the UN Charter and the OAS Charter, which have specific uh, prohibitions against invasions of a sovereign country and invasions of the territorial integrity of other countries. Um, these prohibitions are very strict and clear under international law. The United States actions in violation of human rights also violates the Geneva Conventions, which protect civilians from indiscriminate acts of violence as had occurred against civilian victims in Panama. The four biggest, most important papers in this country all endorsed the rightness of the Panama invasion. That's the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, strong endorsement, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Every one of them. Now, uh, a little body known as the United Nations had a vote about this. On December 29th, they voted by an overwhelming majority to condemn the invasion as, in their words, a flagrant violation of international law. So I was uh, interested to see that night on the NBC Nightly News with that great newscaster Deborah Norville absolutely no mention whatsoever of this vote. Turning to CBS, the bastion of responsible broadcasting, I found a full 10 seconds lavished on that story. At the United Nations today, the General Assembly adopted a resolution deploring the U.S. invasion of Panama as a, quote, flagrant violation of international law. The vote 75 to 20 with 40 abstentions. The media was so cooperative with the government because the media are owned by the same interests that are being defended in Central America by that government policy. The media are not close to corporate America. They're not favorable to corporate America. They are corporate America. They're an integral part of corporate America. We are a plutocracy. We ought to face it. A country in which wealth controls. It may be true of all countries, more or less, but it's uniquely true of ours because of our materialism and the concentration of, of wealth here. 
even our democratic processes are hardly that because money dominates politics and we know it <laughs> and through politics uh, it dominates government and it dominates the media we really need uh, desperately to find new ways to hear independent voices and points of view uh, it's the only way we're going to find the truth the truth about the invasion of Panama remains hidden from most Americans those who have studied the official accounts have discovered many contradictions and have arrived at disturbing conclusions. I have studied uh, everything that the president has said as to reasons why he ordered the invasion. And none of those things, singly or collectively, makes any legal, moral, or constitutional sense. One of the reasons for the invasion was to take the wimp image off President George Bush. He had had the, uh, what now seems to be the necessary blooding of a United States president to show his, uh, his forcefulness and his machismo. This was a chance for the military to show what it could do. If they kill an American Marine, that's real bad. And if they threaten and brutalize the wife of an American citizen, sexually threatening the the, uh, the lieutenant's wife, while kicking him in the groin over and over again, this president is going to do something about it. When he would say that the loss of American life was the last straw, sure, there must be something we could have done. Certainly, there must have been papers we could have filed. We could have gone to the world court. We could have gone to the United Nations or maybe the organizations of American states. But invade a country? because of this is absolutely ridiculous. The excuse that the invasion was to protect American lives is the one that's always given. The fact is there are 35,000 American citizens there and none of them were in any danger. I was there three weeks before the invasion. There's simply no evidence and I don't think the administration has ever bothered to even give any evidence to that statement. The goals of the United States have been to safeguard the lives of Americans to defend democracy in Panama. Then President Bush said we had to go to restore democracy in Panama. How in the world do you restore that which has never existed? Panama has never been a democracy since we created Panama for our own purposes in 1903. And all we did was go down to restore American control and dominance in Panama. The new government installed by the invasion was headed by the U.S.-backed candidates from the aborted national election, Andara, Calderon, and Ford. Hours before the invasion, they were taken to a U.S. military base where they were sworn in as the president and vice presidents. But the new government has enjoyed little popular support within Panama. Anti-government demonstrations occur regularly and there have been numerous attempts from within the Panamanian police force to seize military control of the government. U.S. troops were mobilized several times to crush these insurrections. Every time there's a crisis, the U.S. military takes over. They give orders, they subordinate that military because they don't trust that military force. The conflict is still there. The oligarchy knows that if the United States were not there, they could not rule this country. But President Andara minimizes the significance of America's military occupation in Panama. I think we are a, a very now we practically are have no occupation at all practically uh, I you don't see them in the streets I don't see them uh, uh, in Panama uh, however there are a few here and there but uh, it's, it's not really uh, an occupation of course he's not going to say that um, that Panama is occupied in fact he might not even call it an invasion cousin is 
kind that were killed or massacred. He lives in the nicer area, in the oligarchical area. And, um, you know, his interest was protected. He's not running Panama. He's a puppet of the U.S. government. The U.S. government is running Panama. They're running all of the ministries in Panama. He's only abiding by what he's told to do. The Bush administration claimed that another reason for the invasion was to remove Noriega in order to stem the flow of drugs into the United States. But according to a U.S. General Accounting Office report, cocaine traffic through Panama may have doubled in the two years following the invasion. There is also considerable evidence that key members of Panama's new government, including President Andara, have been tied to the drug trade through banks and front companies that launder drug money. The involvement of uh, the Panamanian economy as a whole in uh, drug trafficking, arms running, various uh, questionable banking practices, in fact, involve most of the Panamanian elite, involve most of the people who now run this new U.S.-approved Panamanian government. And Dara and Ford, we all know, and Panamanians know, that they are the real drug traffickers. They have been, because Panama have had an history of the oligarchy being involved in drug trafficking. In the years preceding and throughout the invasion, the U.S. government and the major media consistently portrayed Manuel Noriega as America's most hated and evil enemy. General Noriega became a mythic figure there was an attempt to personify in Noriega all that was evil. It was very interesting that when General Noriega, when his office was captured, we discovered the red pajamas, the voodoo equipment, and the, the alleged cocaine that he was using, and the pornographic pictures in his desk. Now, I happened to have been in Chile with the United Nations at the time of the overthrow of uh, President Allende. And it's interesting that that same desk appeared in Chile with the pornographic pictures, the red pajamas, and the cocaine. The whole propaganda against him was to build up a pretext in order to invade Panama and to, and to say we invaded Panama because of Noriega. I don't know how, I don't know how uh, any, I don't know how Americans can be so stupid to believe this. I mean, how can you be so stupid? Like, for example, at one time, they had Noriega at gunpoint. They could have taken Noriega then, but the Americans didn't want Noriega. What they really wanted is to destroy the Panamanian army in order to do with the treaties what they wanted, which is what's happening now. Although the U.S. government's reasons for the invasion made no mention of eliminating the Panamanian defense forces, U.S. officials later admitted that destroying the PDF was a central part of the plan. It was not only Mr. Noriega, but his uh, accomplices and underlings who uh, stood for a uh, reprehensible government at the time, and therefore uh, you had to take down not only Mr. Noriega, but take down the elements of his uh, supporting entity in order to reduce the PDF to nothing. One of the objectives of the invasion, main objective, was to destroy the PDF. Why the treaty, the Panama Canal Treaty, they state clearly that the year 2000, Panama will be responsible for the security, the safety of the canal. To be responsible for the safety of a nation, you need to have an army. The elimination the liquidation of the PVF means the extension, the continuity of the United States present as the only military force in our nation, which historically is the United States position. What they really want is to stay in Panama after the year 2000, and that is what they have achieved.
to destroy the Panamanian Defense Forces, to impose a government complacent with U.S. interests, and to make Panama the control center for all of Latin America. The invasion sets the stage for the wars of the 21st century in South America. The 2,000-mile invasion from Washington to Panama City took place primarily with bases from the United States. The essential value of the Southern Command is to give another 2,000 miles of intervention capability, which takes us right into the heart of the Andean coca-producing region, where the wars of the next decade are entirely uh, likely to take place. Panama is another example of destroying a country to save it. Uh, and it's another case of how the United States uh, has exercised a might-make-right doctrine uh, among the smaller countries of the third world. It has long been U.S. practice to invade these countries, get what we want, and leave the people that live there to kind of rot. Our country has been ruined, our homes have been destroyed, and we still have no real answers. So what's left but to take to the streets? Since we didn't lose our lives in the war, we're willing to risk them fighting for our rights. George Bush. May his children be spared what my daughter is being subjected to. My daughter who doesn't want to live. May his generation be spared what our generation is living through. He should ask God for forgiveness for all the damage caused to many families down here. One year ago, the people of Panama lived in fear under the thumb of a dictator. Today, democracy is restored. Panama is free. In March 1991, President Guillermo Endara proposed a constitutional amendment that would forever abolish Panama's right to have an army. Later that year, a law was passed by the United States Congress to renegotiate the Panama Canal Treaties to ensure continued U.S. military presence in Panama on the grounds that Panama was no longer capable of defending the canal. Shut my eyes I've already seen the lights On the faces of the men of war Leading people to the killing floor Till I go down Till I go down Oh yeah Till I go down I'm not gonna shut my eyes
that I pulled down.